All right, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to see you here today. Thank you for giving up your Saturday morning to come seek professional development. I think that speaks volumes of your dedication as an educator, um, and I want to thank you for coming here today. We see all sorts of students come through our classroom, right? We have the rambunctious kids who come in laughing and talking with their friends. We also see those positive, upbeat kids who always give you a wonderful high when they walk in the door. And then there are those kids who are five going on 30. Those are the kind of kids we see on a very day basis. And then there are kids like this girl who is extremely shy. She is um, never, she never causes any trouble in, her cl in the classroom. She doesn't ever get any detentions. She's always getting an A, but she is an introvert. She hates being called upon, and she keeps to herself throughout the day. However, in a smaller group setting, she comes alive. Her sister calls her a chatterbox, wondering when she's ever going to stop talking. This is the dichotomy of the um, introvert. Outwardly shy, but inwardly social. I know this all too well because I was once that girl. Okay. When I was applying to the School of Education, I needed to seek letters of recommendation, but the one that stands out the most to this day is the one that Professor Garfield wrote for me. She said that Alice was the quiet thinker in the corner. I never raised my hand or contributed in a class discussion but my place to shine was in the work I produced. She recognized this and saw the potential in me. So how can we help our students? We are always thinking about how to best serve them. And oftentimes, we focus on the kids with the low grades or the ones who are our English learners or the ones with special needs. And we absolutely do need to remember to teach to those groups. However, what about the kids who are seemingly successful on the outside, but are struggling to express themselves on the inside? During my um, schooling, I had wonderful teachers, and I sincerely appreciate everything that they have done towards my academic success. However, the traditional curriculum didn't always meet my needs, and didn't develop this other part that really was dying to come out. I hated to hold, raise my hand in class. Um, I prefer to weigh my ideas and really think them through being, instead of being put on the spot. We have students like these in our classroom every day. The traditional curriculum didn't always test or showcase my learning. I always struggled with a multiple choice test, overthinking it, wondering if there was possibly more than one right answer, because I sometimes was able to rationalize more than one answer. The traditional curriculum didn't always allow out-of-the-box thinking, and sometimes our imagination was kept hidden inside instead. I have always had problems with this clothing tag, one, fits, one size fits all. Obviously, that doesn't apply to someone like me. Um, and sometimes I think we approach education in the same exact way. It's really one size fits some. Right. Okay. Um, the US Department of Education has defined personalized learning as putting students at the center okay, and empowers them and take control of their own learning by providing flexibility on several occasions. So personalized learning is about voice, choice, and agency. How can we give students the microphones they need so that their voices could be heard? How do we build student agency and empower all learners? How can we incorporate, incorporate personalized learning in our lesson plans? Let me tell you the story of a student I once had. Her name was Crystal. Crystal was brilliant. She was your straight-A student, excelling on every exam, 
producing the kind of essays that you would use as a model for your classroom. But she also hated raising her hands. Nobody knew how brilliant she was, except for me, because I got to see her work. However, many years ago, I started to include student blogging in my curriculum. My students write to prompts that I um, come up with, but they are also free to write on topics of their own choice. In this platform, Crystal truly bloomed. Her debut came in the form of this blog post she wrote about how to, she taught her immigrant grandmother how to use the computer. Suddenly, all her peers knew that she had this talent as well. I wasn't the sole audience of her work. This is what she wrote. Something I always found difficult was participating in class. Then Ms. Chen introduced blogging to us. It was like a whole new world opened up to me. That's what we want to hear from our students. Personalized learning takes place all over the world. And it's about addressing career skills, creativity, and critical thinking as well. Let's put the spotlight where it belongs, on the work of the students. Here is an example. Um, National History Day. Any of you have heard of it? I had never actually heard of it until my um, oldest start went into elementary school and he participated as an extracurricular activity. Um, today, as a matter of fact, he was chosen to advance to the district level and he is presenting his work as a ninth grader. National History Day allows students to choose topics on any part in history as long as it fit with the annual theme. That gave them a lot of choice. They can examine any part of history that fit this particular theme of the year. Um, it gives students the opportunity to learn about topics not traditionally taught in the classroom. For my son and his partner, they decided to study the Nanjing Massacre, a very little known part of US, I'm sorry, of world history. For National History Day, students also have a choice in how they want to deliver this information. They could use, um, they could create documentaries, an exhibit, write an essay, create a performance, or create a, build, a website. So they have a lot of choice um, in how they want to showcase their learning. And they also have agency because then they could share their learning with a large audience as well. It's truly an authentic project. Here is another example. Lessons. That's taking learning from the classroom and into the real world. They have a nonprofit business and they donate to charity and also provide scholarships. His students design, plan, create, and sell their inventions. At Hillbrook School, where one of my friends is the director of technology, they take project-based learning in a new direction. Usually, Makerspace is about making something out of different parts. He took it in a different direction when this student, Connor, wanted to learn how smartphones work. So they tore down a smartphone in order to understand the components and how this works. So he says, I like to think of it as a breaker space, the inverse of maker space. 20% time is um, a policy that Google has adopted in which he, they give their employees time to pursue a passion project of their choosing as a part of their um, job. A lot of teachers have taken that idea and put it into their classroom. Sometimes it's called genius hour, sometimes it's called a passion project, but the idea is students choose and develop their own learning. In my classroom, um, my students have a choice of championing a cause, learning new skills and teaching it to others, or develop a real product or service. Their projects have to be risky, meaning it must be real. It must show measurable impact on others. They must acquire new skills. They must take knowledge and transform it in new ways. And I tell them it has to be about you, about your um, passion. 
So these two students um, are competitive golfers. I have these two students who are competitive golfers, and they decided to develop a business in teaching golf lessons. Um, they built a website. They had, as you can see, um, a pricing point. And as evidenced by their photos and their sales ledger, they definitely had some really good clients. Another um, group of students decided to create and design these fluffy friends out of socks. And they were used as kind of the alternative to a stress ball. And they gave them out for free. And they surveyed people who use this stress ball. And 100% of all students said that they actually felt a release of tension from using these fluffy friends. Another couple of students decided to offer a dog walking um, service along with bathing dogs as well. These are some of their clients. One of my students told me, because of your class, I found out that I do have an imagination. What struck me was that she was 13 years old when she discovered this. What happened to the first 13 years of her life? This is an email I got from parents. It's great that you give students practical writing projects and real life skills. In my district, we have this hashtag, all means all, because we believe in creating an inclusive environment for every student in our district. Let's put students in the driver's seat of learning by allowing them to create content derived from the knowledge they gain from your lessons. So here's the challenge. As we plan our lessons, how can you incorporate voice, choice, and agency? How, let's empower our students and make the classroom a place where all students shine. Thank you.